After the release of the third and final instalment in the Dark Souls series, and with it being all but confirmed that there would not be a fourth entry, fans of FromSoft's groundbreaking style of game wondered worldwide. What comes next? Bloodborne 2 maybe? A different genre of game entirely? We didn't know. The last piece of gaming content that FromSoft had put out was in March of 2017, that being the apocalyptic swan song that was Dark Souls 3's second and last DLC, The Ringed City, and as is the way with FromSoft, there'd be nary a peep nor inkling as to what their next project might be for another 15 months. But on June of 2018, the E3 Gaming Expo, anyone remember E3? Soulsborne fans would finally receive the gracious gift of a gaming reveal, that being the official trailer for our brand new IP, Sekiro, Shadows Die Twice. But as Dark Souls had a distinctly dark fantasy setting and feel, and Bloodborne delved deep into the Gothic, the Eldritch and the Sanguine, Sekiro would take place in a fictionalised version of Japan, circa the 16th century. In place of knights and demons, or hunters and beasts, it'd bring samurai and shinobi, although Sekiro would certainly present a strong emphasis on the supernatural and the grotesque also. Furthermore, while Soulsborne fans had up until this point only dreamed of the gameplay possibilities of a true vertical jump, Sekiro would finally make it a reality, introducing proper platforming, grappling hook and all, offering true verticality, increasing the depth and potential for exploration and level design. A new emphasis on stealth would also be introduced, allowing the player to utilise furtive shinobi techniques, preying on foes from above, below and behind, striking out with violent death blows, adding an additional element of impact to an already frantic combat system. No longer would there be an action RPG focus on levelling builds and roleplay either, but rather an emphasis on lightning quick swordplay with dodges falling into the background and the audiovisual feast that is the deflect system being fired into the foreground. Soulsborne had been accelerated, although rather than Sekiro merely being an evolution of the formula which would be built upon with subsequent titles, it was far more its own thing, being the most unique and experimental of all of FromSoft's modern titles, though still containing that core Soulsborne DNA and difficulty. As far as my own historical experiences with the game, I will be honest, I wasn't super captivated by that initial reveal trailer, or at least not to the extent that I was with games like Dark Souls 3, and especially Elden Ring, which would of course come out three years later. I didn't think the game looked bad by any means, and I was certainly looking forward to playing it, but I guess the somewhat more grounded, historical look of the setting didn't appeal to me quite as much though as it turned out, there'd be plenty of outlandish and monstrous happenings throughout the land of Ashina, where Sekiro is set. When the big release day in March of 2019 did come, I of course played the hell out of it, eventually finishing up the next week, but for all the thoughts and opinions I had on the game, there was one personal take which reigned supreme. This game was hard. Since that initial playthrough, I've gone on to play through it again probably another 5 or 6 times through the years, and for whatever reason, my skill level seems to fluctuate wildly from playthrough to playthrough, sometimes dying well over 100 times through the game, while other times dying maybe 20. And while certain Soulsborne players seem to get fully erect at the prospect of dying over and over and over again in a game, it can have the opposite effect on me, rendering me completely flaccid. And in fact, the sheer brutal frantic difficulty of Sekiro Shadows Die Twice has always kept me from being able to fully declare I love this game in the same way that I have with the Dark Souls series, Bloodborne and Elden Ring, though I will say that after this most recent playthrough, I think I'm nearly there. And so folks, with that introduction out of the way, I think it's high time that I got right into Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. Very quick note about the structure of the video before I begin. I'll first provide a setup of the world, key characters and story, and then we'll fire into discussions about the various elements of the game before touching back on the story at around the midpoint of the video, then finishing up towards the end. Enjoy! 
As I mentioned in my introduction, Sekiro is set in a fictionalised version of Japan many hundreds of years ago, and the intro cutscene shows us the scene of a brutal, bloody battle between the forces of Ashina and the forces of the interior Japanese ministry. We are introduced to three very important and awesome characters here. The first is Ishin Ashina, engaged in deadly combat with the general of the opposing army. By the way, I love how insanely massive the general is here, and when you consider how tall Ishin himself is, as we'll see later, this general dude must be about 10 foot tall. Anyway, as we see, Ishin wins the fight, and thus his coup succeeds and his clan wrests control of the land of Ashina back from the hands of the interior ministry. The other two important characters we meet are the great shinobi, Owl, who is also fighting for Ashina, and a young orphaned boy who Owl takes in, dubbing him Wolf. This is a very interesting scene because, although Arwa effectively saves the boy in a sense, it's initiated by a gesture of casual bloodshed as he slices his cheek open with his enormous sword, and as we see as the story progresses, Arwa is anything but a kind-hearted saviour. From here, Wolf is trained to become a master shinobi, having the Iron Code instilled in him. He swears an oath to a master by the name of Kuro, a young boy and divine heir of an ancient bloodline, However, the story skips forward by several years at this point, and we see Wolf sitting in a well, lost, broken, and without purpose, having apparently lost both his father, who was killed, and his master Kuro, who was stolen away despite his protection. Thus, the game truly starts with a mysterious woman from above dropping a letter down into the gloom, indicating that Wolf should head to the nearby Moonview Tower. Although the player is totally in the dark about any details of Wolf's service to his master Kuro and the death of Owl, all we know is that things went very, very badly, and indeed, eavesdropping on nearby Ashina soldiers reveals that they are fully aware of the nearby fallen shinobi in the well, but are completely unconcerned about him, considering him to be a depressed, failed coward. Yeah, I'm sure he's nothing to worry about. With the superior athletic abilities of a shinobi, Wolf makes it to the Moonview Tower and is reunited with Kuro. Again, interesting scene because Wolf's body language betrays hints of shame, being unable to even look Kuro in the eye as he greets him, and no wonder when Kuro was literally just five minutes away while Wolf was walling in a well, although we do quickly learn that Wolf is missing large chunks of his memory due to some significant incident from a few years back, and thus it's left unanswered what exactly he's been doing since that incident, how he found himself in the well, and how much of his inactivity is due to his damaged memory. Kuro gifts Wolf back his sword, Kusabi Maru, with the plan being for him to cut a path through the reservoir so that they can both escape out through a secret passage and out of Ashina. Of course, Wolf's skills of swordsmanship are a wee bit rusty. That wasn't my fault, it was Wolf's fault but we do make it through the secret door and out into a small moonlit field of silver grass. However, the exit is barred by another key character in the story, Kenichiro Ashina, the adopted grandson of Lord Ishin, and now himself the leader of the Ashina clan. We don't know why at this point, but Genichiro does not want Kuro to leave Ashina, and in fact it was he who had him locked up in the Moonview Tower in the first place. Thus, a fight takes place between Genichiro and Kuro's loyal wolf. The odds are stacked against you in this fight and there are no second chances, but win or lose, the outcome is the same. Wolf has his left arm sliced off and is left for dead, while Genichiro takes back Kuro, delivering him deeper into the territory of Ashina, a troubled land which is on the verge of another war with the interior ministry, a war which will take a miracle for Ashina to win. This is not the end for Wolf, however and while lying there bleeding and broken amongst the grass, an equally one-armed sculptor drags his body back to a dilapidated temple on the Ashina outskirts to heal and recover, replacing his left arm with a somewhat morbid yet ingenious device called a shinobi prosthetic, providing full limb functionality and far, far more. Here, the sculptor explains that his master, Kuro, is still alive and being held in captivity in Ashina Castle, and that the shinobi prosthetic fixed onto his left arm will help him both reach and infiltrate that heavily guarded castle. Like with many things about the game, we don't know very much about this mysterious sculptor just yet, but it's clear that he's sombre and secretive, and hiding a bloody past. 
Also, his missing left arm and knowledge of shinobi techniques brings up striking parallels with Wolf's own character and situation, a theme which gets expanded on later. And thus, Wolf has his new mission, to make it to Ashina Castle and rescue his young master, the divine heir, Kuro. Compared to all other Soulsborne titles, Sekiro's story is far more lucid and indeed, it actually has a plotline, not to mention a fully voice acted protagonist. Of course, that's not to say that everything that transpires in the story is easy to follow and that the game will end with all your questions answered because you still really need to pay attention to key events and dialogue to have a decent idea of what the hell is actually happening and whose side who is even on. Furthermore, there is much less of an emphasis on item descriptions serving as a means to deliver lore to the player and in fact, I'd say that as far as emphasis goes, Sekiro is a moderate plot, low lore compared to the low plot, high lore of Dark Souls, Elden Ring and Bloodborne. Due to this, Sekiro succeeds in delivering an experience with a greater emotional weight because it has true characters who meaningfully interact with Wolf, who himself actually develops as a character towards the end, though the nature of that development depends on which of the game's four endings you go for. So, now that I've provided that setup, let's talk gameplay. At the beginning, whilst on the way to Moonview Tower to rescue Kuro, all Wolf can really do is run, jump and grab. Although our movement options do expand shortly, it quickly becomes clear that at least as far as the platforming and general traversal of the environment is concerned, Sekiro is a forgiving game. Wolf can fall from pretty damn high up without taking damage, and even if you really push the envelope and land from a ridiculous height, the fall damage taken really won't be all that severe, being survivable in most cases. Of course, the mountainous land of Ashina is also surrounded by death pits, made all the more perilous due to Wolf's death-defying acrobatics and ledge grabs. However, the term death pits is something of a misnomer in this case, because as long as you have a decent enough chunk of health remaining, Wolf will just emerge from a nearby ledge, a wee bit worse for wear, with the implication being that he latched on with the grappling hook of his shinobi prosthetic. And this grappling hook is one of the things which really sets Sekiro apart from the previous Soulsborne titles. For as credible as the Dark Souls games were, they were never really praised for the player's capacity for mobility. Yes, they dabbled in some platforming here and there, and yes, jumping did technically exist, and yes, there was certainly verticality to be found, who could forget White Town or the Great Hollow. But these games didn't feel great to jump around in, and they weren't meant to feel great to jump around in. You're a knight, in heavy armour, and a big ass dagger. In Sekiro, however, the mobility is one of the main draws, and so FromSoft made it as effortless as possible. Even in some of the later areas where the environment really opens up, the level of challenge associated with jumping to a distant ledge or using the grappling hook to pull Wolf to some far off branch pretty much remains the same throughout the entire game. Of course, the difficulty of Sekiro is very much associated with other core aspects of the game, but the core movement can be mastered in about 10 minutes. If a ledge, branch or other miscellaneous grappling point is within eyesight for Wolf, it will be highlighted with a white circular icon, and once it's within distance of the grappling hook, it will turn green, and at that point all it takes is the press of a button to send Wolf hurtling towards it. And of course, Wolf can chain together successive grapples ad nauseum, as long as there are viable grappling points within range, allowing for some very satisfying, efficient manoeuvring. If you know a level well, then the extent with which you can use the grappling hook for navigation and exploration is immense, but even if you're just learning the layout of a new environment, sometimes all you need to do is run, jump and tap the L2 button and away you go. Of course, this element of movement isn't quite without its own elements of frustration also, and indeed, sometimes a distant branch will look like it'll enter into range if you just take that big running jump, and there you are, further and further out from the safety of the ground, waiting for that bloody circle to turn green, but then it doesn't turn green, and you die. But then actually you don't really die, you just lose a wee bit of health. This is what I'm saying about how forgiving the movement is. Even taking the grappling hook out of the equation altogether, Wolf can make some absurdly dangerous jumps from great heights and then grasp onto a ledge 20 metres below like it's nothing. In fact, there's something almost disconcerting about the complete lack of a sound effect when you grab onto a ledge. Ledge. When you grab onto a ledge or land on the ground from high up. Maybe this would be better. 
Uh, maybe not. Wolf does feel extremely light in this game though when considering the grabbing of said ledges, the minimal fall damage and how high he can jump and wall jump and wall jump 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 jump. My only real criticism of the movement in Sekiro is that much like Elden Ring, it doesn't really evolve from the start of the game to the end. The core mechanics are established early on and then by the end of the game you're still just using those same moves. Of course, Wolf finds many other tools throughout Ashina which can be adapted for this shinobi prosthetic, but they all only pertain to combat rather than navigation. With all this zipping across the map and double jumping, you need some big bonny environments to traverse and explore, with formidable foes and interesting items, and Sekiro absolutely delivers. With this new capacity for verticality, and this novel introduction of pleasure and suction, the level design has also had an update and now there are far more opportunities and possibilities for getting through any given section of the level. Sekiro's actual higher level world design is a wee bit complex though. I don't mean to keep comparing this game to Dark Souls because it's just a different game at the end of the day, but whereas Firelink Shrine in the first game effectively served as a key central location from which several other key locations could be accessed, Sekiro doesn't really have such a location, but then nor would I call this game linear at all. Furthermore, it does kind of have a hub area, but then halfway through the game an additional hub area is presented, but then this becomes partly inaccessible for a brief period, and also the hub areas never really get all that populated anyway. Although you will meet a variety of characters out in the world, they'll tend to either progressively do their own thing from place to place, or just even remain in the same spot for you to return back to and visit later on. Anyway, right from the start after leaving the temple, it'll become clear that you as a player have options. You can always barrel forward on ground level and engage enemies with no thought for subtlety or discretion, or you can travel to higher ground and assess things from above, out of eye line and earshot. Nearly wherever you go in the game world, you'll have a variety of possibilities available to you, but don't think that the options are only ever restricted to high or low, because as well as the various lateral routes to take at ground level for given set pieces, many environments particularly in places like Ashina Castle, the Sunken Valley and Senpu Temple offer traversal up and through several different levels of elevation and there's almost never really a correct specific route to take because it all depends on whether you want to focus on slowly and quietly picking enemies off one by one through stealth, launch a loud, chaotic full frontal attack or, as will be the preference for most people I imagine, a bit of both. Speaking of full frontal attacks, I imagine some of you might be thinking by now, when the hell is he going to talk about the damn combat? Never. I will never talk about the combat. In fact, I'm just going to stay silent and make the screen black for the remainder of the video. Okay, let's talk about the combat. FromSoft took a rather bold initial move with Sekiro's combat system, dispensing with the massive selections of weapons and armour found with their Souls games. Even Bloodborne, which was criticised by some for a lack of weapon variety, had around 40 total weapons and a respectable number of clothing sets to tailor your good hunter with. Indeed, this degree of customisation and fashion souls was and is a main draw for many players, offering totally different playstyles, radically different aesthetics from player to player, and a deep capacity for replayability and gameplay variety. With Sekiro, however, there are no additional armour sets, excluding the three unlockable skins retroactively added into the game a year and a half after its initial release. What's more is that you basically use the same weapon the entire way through the game. Now of course, that latter statement isn't entirely true, because there are 10 shinobi tools scattered throughout Ashina which can be fitted to Wolf's prosthetic, offering interesting, creative and effective solutions to slay your enemies. I'll talk more about these various tools later on, but even with these as well as the various skills and ninjutsu techniques learned throughout your journey, your sword is always your prime tool for offence and defence, both of which work in tandem with the other in this game. So, with all this meat having been trimmed off the bone for Sekiro, Shadows Die Twice, does the combat hold up? Does it offer alternative mechanics to replace that which was shed? Absolutely. So let's get into more detail about all that. There is just one attack button in Sekiro, and you're going to be pressing it a lot. In fact, the standard sword slash attack can effectively be endlessly chained together without ever having to wait for stamina to recharge, because there is no stamina in this game, not for movement and not for combat. 
As well as the standard standing slash, there's also a thrust attack which can be performed by simply holding down the attack button, and of course, you can also attack while jumping, though I did find this to be of rather limited effectiveness. Another core combat mechanic, and in fact the mechanic which defines combat in Sekiro, is the deflect. Deflections are extremely simple to perform, and indeed I think it's the simplicity of this mechanic which contributes to its brilliance. When an enemy attacks, you just press the block button right before the attack, and hey presto, you've performed a successful deflection. Pretty easy, right? But what about when the enemy does this? Or this? Yeah, things get harder then. Wolf can also simply block enemy attacks, but of course this is less flashy and offers no offensive advantage because it does not build up the enemy's posture bar. See, I just mentioned that FromSoft had done away with the stamina bar, but that doesn't mean that they didn't replace it with anything else, because in Sekiro, both Wolf and every enemy in the game have posture. There are just two things which build your posture bar, and that's getting hit or blocking an attack. Either of these things happen and your posture bar builds, which is undesirable by the way and the enemy's posture remains the same. And similarly, if you hit an enemy, their posture builds and yours stays the same. That's one of the big differences between posture and stamina. With stamina, you can only attack so many times before it just runs out, and thus you need to pay close attention to it and know when to attack, evade and when to hold back. With posture, however, this is inverted, because now there's no reason for you to stop attacking other than to deflect when attacked, and you might be surprised at just how effective tapping the attack button is for a lot of Sekiro's enemies. Ah, but what about when an enemy attacks? Do we block? Sure, you could, but then your posture bar goes up. So how about a dodge? Are those still a thing? You betcha, kiddo. Sorry, I'll stop talking like that. But dodges are indeed still a thing, and what's more, they can be really effective, although less so than ever before due to most enemies' significant enhancement in being able to track and swivel to meet the player even mid-attack. And what's more is that all rowing does is prevent you from taking damage, whilst offering no further advantage towards victory. No, what you want to do, and what you need to get very good at very quickly, is deflecting. Because a successful deflect will cancel out all regular damage and posture damage to the player, as well as build the enemy's posture bar up until the point where the posture bar maxes out, allowing for a fast, satisfying death blow. See, it doesn't matter whether you deplete the enemy's health bar fully or fill up the posture bar completely. Both of these outcomes are worth the same, and when you can see that posture bar right on the cusp of filling up and you're close to death and the enemy is hitting you with combos and counters, you quickly gain an understanding of why a Sekiro's combat system is so highly praised. Deflections are somewhat comparable to parries, except the timing is more generous and the combat is tailored to demand consistent successful deflections. For many basic enemies, one or perhaps two deflections might be enough to facilitate a death blow, but for the game's many bosses and mini bosses, you've got to chain together deflection after deflection, squeezing in attacks when possible and deflecting some more until either that health bar is empty or that posture bar is full, and then do it all over again because bosses have to be death blowed. Death blown? Two or even three times before their true defeat. Thus, FromSoft created a combat system where defence is just as important as offence, if not more so. I say this because for many enemies and bosses, it's quite possible to attack only sparingly, focusing all attention on successful deflections to build up that posture, although admittedly, this would be a pretty dull way to play. This is one of the reasons why the options for different weapons were scaled back so much. It was to trim any excess fat so as to render a system more tight, satisfying and precise than perhaps any other such game. The system is too thrilling to get dull, because there's no validity in choosing to hand back when in the midst of combat here. Yes, situations can get far too hot, especially when stealth goes awry and you're faced with more enemies than you can reasonably handle, but in such cases, the best option is to just get the hell out of there altogether and wait until everyone has lost your trace and gone back to the usual patrols, rather than stand 5 feet back and play passively. 
While I'm on the subject of combat, we've got to talk about perilous attacks. The earliest you'll encounter perilous attacks will be in your initial doomed fight with Genichiro at the end of the tutorial, but for new players at this point, it's highly unlikely that they'll understand what to even make of these alarming red symbols. There are three common types of perilous attack which typically come up in both regular and boss encounters, though there are actually two other special types to be encountered sometime later. The three main varieties, however, are thrusts, sweeps and grabs, none of which can be blocked. Thrusts are my personal favourite, because they can either be deflected outright, or better yet, can be overcome with the Makiri counter in the coolest animation that has ever been... animated. And I know I won't be on my own when I say that Makiri counters are the single most satisfying move to pull off in Sekiro's combat. Whilst deflections are a valid way to defend against thrusts, and will be the only defensive counter available full stop at the beginning of the game, Makiri counters should always be used once they're unlocked, dealing more posture damage to the enemy and having much more forgiving timing. The first time you unlock the move and read the description though, it's a bit confusing because it asks you to literally dodge into the enemy's thrust, pretty much the opposite of what most players would naturally want to do in such a situation, but when you pull off that first Makiri counter, it feels so good. It feels good bro. The next type of perilous attack is the sweep, and these can't be deflected at all. Instead, they must be jumped. Again, the timer for the jump tends to be really generous, and I found that as long as you hit that jump button, you won't take damage, even if the attack seems to pass through your character model. After jumping a sweep, this can then be followed up with a slightly comical hop to the head, again dealing high posture damage to the enemy, although some sweeps really won't give you the opportunity for this follow up head bounce. Again, really fun manoeuvre to pull off, but I've always had a bit less success with this one compared to the Makiri counter, largely because my instinct will tend to be to jump away from the attack, whereas the optimal thing to do is to simply jump up in place so that you're well positioned for the follow up head jump. The third common type of perilous attack is the grab, and these are the least desirable of the three to see coming, because there's not really a designated high posture damaging counter to it. Rather, all you can do is dodge out of the way and perhaps follow up with a quick attack before resuming combat. The first time most players will see grabs, and lots of them, is in the ogre boss fight near the start of the game, and they can be really hard to deal with due to the speed at which they come out. The main thing which makes perilous attacks so dangerous, especially for a newer player who isn't yet familiar with the enemy movesets, is that you do not know whether it's a thrust, a sweep, or a grab at first. All that frightening red symbol and its accompanying sound cue tells you is that a perilous attack is coming, and you figure out the rest. Sometimes it'll be pretty obvious based on the animation, but as other times you'll be left baffled over what the hell kind of attack is even coming. And when you're in the middle of a difficult, tense boss, there's not really any time to sit there wondering. You have to act quickly, hesitate, and you lose. Thus, you will die against these attacks and then die again several times more until you know which animations correspond to which type of perilous attacks. And expectedly, this leads to a lot of frustration on early playthroughs, because you're being hit by high damage attacks which you can't yet reasonably expect it to be able to comprehend as they happen. Also, the indicator for these attacks really doesn't give you a reliable indication of when the attack is actually coming. In some cases, it'll be appropriate to make the corresponding counteraction pretty much as soon as you see and hear the cue, whereas at other times you might be tricked into acting too early. Again, the only way you can really learn this is by getting hit. Also, sometimes there won't even be an indicator for an incoming perilous attack, although admittedly, this is very rare. Despite these degrees of frustration associated with perilous attacks, I love their inclusion and they do wonders for making combat that extra bit interesting. You can be deep in the rhythm of a tough boss, nailing deflection after deflection and getting a hit in when you can, but when you see that red symbol, you either panic and die, or react and get rewarded with a sizeable amount of posture damage to the enemy, and I think it's this rewarding aspect of them which makes them so enjoyable to counter. So, although there are other elements of combat to discuss, those are the core mechanics that will make or break any given combat encounter. Shinobi tools, combat arts and ninjutsu arts all serve as additional variables and modifiers to aid in either defence or offence, but the basic attack and the deflect are god here. But here's the thing, Sekiro can be really, really hard. I'm talking insanely hard. 
On my very first playthrough, I struggled like hell on this game. Early game mini bosses like General Tenzin and the Ashina outskirts were a complete frustrating nightmare for me. And when I got to uh, the big spear dude outside the Moonview Tower, Jesus Christ, I wasn't even having fun. Although regular enemies can and will destroy your health bar, you can usually take two or three hits without dying, but with the bosses, your health bar really does not go a long way, especially near the start when your health and posture are still very low, not to mention your low healing gourd capacity. See, although you don't level up as such in Sekiro, there's absolutely still capacity to make Wolf increasingly tough as the game progresses. Although there aren't cool new weapons and armour dotted around the world, there are still a decent variety of consumable items to provide an edge in combat, such as pellets, which provide some passive healing over a 10 second period, fistfuls of ash, which can be thrown at enemies briefly stunning them, or the various Buddhist candy items, which provide temporary buffs to things like offense, defense, or posture, though there are more items still. The most important discoverable items of all, however, are the prayer beads, because for every four of these found, Wolf can increase both its max health and posture by one increment, as well as getting an interesting snippet of lore for every successive prayer necklace achieved. A lot of these prayer beads are very well hidden, although most of these are actually rewards for defeating many bosses, nearly all of which are totally optional, as well as easily missable in many cases. Although the increase in health and posture granted with each prayer necklace seems quite small initially, there will actually be a really big difference between Wolf's health bar at the start of the game and his health bar towards the end of the game if you've been diligently exploring each level and you really, really need that precious health in this game, because it makes no apologies for some enemies completely disrespecting your meagre health bar. I of course mentioned Sekiro's brutal difficulty and although this whole game is tough as hell, the start in particular is a trial by fire due to only having one or two small heals from your gourd, at least until you find more gourd seeds, much the same way as Estes Flask Shard upgrades worked in Dark Souls 2 and 3. With very few exceptions, there are no combat shortcuts in Sekiro. In Dark Souls, you can keep your distance and bombard the enemy with magic or arrows or concoct up some obscene build designed to obliterate the enemy in a few turns, but here you cannot do that, or at least not entirely. I guess we should talk stealth at this point and then come back to combat afterwards. At this point I've nearly abandoned the idea of ever having clean logical structures to my videos, just try and enjoy the chaos. Wolf is a shinobi, and so as well as possessing a level of swordsmanship to literally rival the greatest warriors in the land, he is also a master of stealth and assassination. Although there's not really a wrong way to go about combat situations in this game, for most players the optimal approach will be to remain in stealth upon reaching any new area containing enemies, either hiding above, below, or unseen amidst the tall grass. The stealth mechanics are actually really quite simple, and rather than being revolutionary in their own right, simply feel and work very well, particularly due to the excellent mobility the player has when controlling Wolf. If an enemy spots you, a white empty triangle above their heads will begin to fill up, with the rate of its increase or decrease being determined by how clearly visible you are at that time. If they're allowed to fill up, the triangle turns yellow, signalling that the enemy is now aware of a disturbance and will investigate, with their visibility cone seeming to increase whilst in this mode, from what I could tell. And if the player still does not make themselves scarce, then that triangle will turn red and the enemy will rush you and likely start to alert their allies, although just because one enemy in an area has been alerted doesn't mean that all nearby enemies will automatically know exactly where you are. When the enemy is still in white or yellow mode, they are eligible, probably not the right word to use there, eligible to be brutally stealth killed, although it's harder to execute a stealth kill on a wary enemy. If I had to describe Sekiro's stealth kills in one adjective, I'd use the word impactful. When an enemy is in range as you're closing distance to them from behind or wherever else, and that glowing red dot in the centre of their body appears followed by a fast, efficient stab to the side of the neck all in about 2 seconds flat, it's a damned satisfying feeling, not only from an audio visual standpoint, but also from a gameplay one, because that's one less enemy left to potentially mess you up. 
See, the peril associated with most encounters in Sekiro makes those fast, efficient stealth kills feel all the more rewarding, because there's always a chance that that very enemy could have spelled your doom. Or perhaps not, because as we'll discuss shortly, shadows die twice. Without a doubt the most satisfying of all stealth kills though, is of course the aerial takedown. Oh that sweet aerial takedown, it sings to me. It's enough to make a man sick. See, the verticality adds a whole new dimension to the level traversal and exploration, but the same can be said for the combat, because there's nothing quite like grappling up to a high vantage point, scouting out the area for all threats, picking a target and then leaping out and crashing down on them from above. It's actually pretty surprising how bloody well this all works too, and although there will be the odd time where you jump off from a height and the death blow prompt just doesn't appear because your positioning wasn't quite right, most of the time it works just how you want it to. As for the usefulness of stealth as a whole, I did feel that it varied somewhat throughout the game. So at first, in Ashina, I used it a damn lot because my health was low and because you'll find yourself greatly outnumbered very early on. Then, around the middle portion of the game, in places like the Sunken Valley, Mibu Village and even Senpu Temple to some extent, I didn't utilise stealth quite as much, largely because it didn't feel quite as necessary due to the nature and number of enemies at these locations. You want me to stealth kill a monkey? Listen, you're not going to make a monkey out of me. Then, towards the last stretch of the game, particularly at Fountainhead Palace and Ashina as it's being attacked by the Interior Ministry, I definitely suddenly felt the need for stealth again, due to the introduction of some very intimidating enemies, and lots of them. Of course, it will mostly be regular enemies that you're sundering with stealth, but where it becomes especially useful is with mini-bosses, and even some regular bosses. See, you'll typically just come across mini-bosses whilst out in the world, often in normal areas and usually with no grand entrance or fanfare. The giveaways will be the boss health bar at the top left, but also visible here are the two red dots, each of which essentially denote the number of life bars that boss has left, and pretty much every money boss in this game will only properly go down after the second death blow. And that's why it's very kind of FromSoft to make mini bosses completely vulnerable to stealth takedowns, effectively allowing you to cut their total health in half with a single visceral stab. This is a godsend in the early game when up against the tougher mini bosses, because even though they are almost all optional, you should fight them because they'll usually drop a prayer bead when beaten, and also they tend to be really fun and challenging to fight. Almost everything in this game is really fun to fight, because every action, every deflection, every button press matters. But bosses are not the only entities in this game which have multiple lives, because Wolf himself also has this ability, this being another of Sekiro's defining gameplay features, as well as what the game's very subtitle refers to. See, Wolf's master, Kuro, is mostly referred to by others as the Divine Heir. Blood of an ancient line flows through his very veins, and this is not just frivolous pomposity either. Kuro truly has divine powers, and he himself cannot even bleed. Three years previous to the events of the game, at the Hirata estate where Kuro resided, the place was raided by bandits while the samurai of the estate were off in a battle, and thus it was raided and set ablaze. And as well as this, Wolf's foster father, Owl, apparently succumbs to injuries sustained during the ambush. Also, just in case anyone isn't super familiar with the game and is confused, we get to experience all the events of Harata firsthand by reliving the memories of Wolf through the use of a special bell charm offered to a Buddhist statue within the dilapidated temple. Yeah, it's a bit confusing, but the point is, things went from bad to worse at Harata, and as well as the death of Owl, Wolf does battle with another former mentor of his, named Lady Butterfly, who seemed to be holding Kuro captive there with the power of her illusions. Just after the battle with Lady Butterfly, however, Wolf is brutally stabbed through the back with a certain sword, and left for dead in that blazing hidden temple. However, his master and divine heir, Kuro, appears to save his saviour, bestowing Wolf with the power of his ancient blood, the power of immortality. Immortality is in fact the central driver of pretty much all the events of Sekiro, and in fact it exists in several different forms throughout Ashina, though some of those forms are anything but divine. Thus, whenever Wolf is defeated in battle, he has the power to get right back up again, regardless of how dire his injuries are. 
and trust me, he faces some pretty dire injuries throughout the game. The resurrection can't simply be spammed of course, and in most cases you'll get just one additional resurrection after an initial death, although a bit later into the game, an additional resurrection slot is unlocked, and for the game's longer, more gruelling boss fights, those revivals are a literal godsend. See, as brutally challenging as the game often is, it's certainly not merciless when you consider the power of stealth and the very ability to rise from death. When death does occur though, Sekiro can be rather punishing with its penalty. For every other Soulsborne game, as well as pretty much every Souls-like game of the last 10 years, when you die, you leave a bloodstain or some such, and making it back to that bloodstain without dying again means that you get all your souls back, or echoes, or whatever else. In Sekiro though, there is no bloodstain system. Death means losing half of all your money, however much that might be, as well as half of your XP. There is always a chance that after death, unseen aid will activate, meaning no loss of EXP or sen, but this is totally random, ranging from a 2% chance to happen at the lowest end, and up to a 30% chance to happen at the higher end. I must say that I am not a big fan of this system. Yes, the bloodstain mechanic has been done to death at this point, but that's because it's a great mechanic, and so even if you do croak it whilst out in combat, or from falling off a chain like a dumbass in Dark Souls 2, you can still get back everything that you lost, whereas in Sekiro, the chance to get back what you lost is based on chance rather than skill. Although the EXP loss is certainly annoying, it's the Sen loss which can be a real kick in the nuts, because if you happen to be carrying a lot of it, then it is a real ball ache when you lose literally half due to a death, because you will die in Sekiro, a lot. I played unusually well throughout this playthrough, but I still died about 20 times. One thing you can do however, is effectively bank your money by buying coin purses at the game's merchants for a very small loss, converting that soft money into hard money which can be popped whenever you like just like consumable souls in Dark Souls. Still, even with this small mercy, not a big fan of the penalty for death in Sekiro. Now that we're at around the midpoint of the video-ish, I'd like to flesh out some details on three of Sekiro's key characters before returning back to talking about the gameplay. See, my favourite character in the game, and I think the most badass character out of any FromSoft game, is Ishin Ashina. Of course, we see him in the opening cutscene which takes place during the rebellion against the interior ministry, but 20 years have passed since then by the time Wolf begins his rescue mission, and thus, Ishin is past his prime, and stricken with some ambiguous terminal illness. Despite his failing condition, he's still perhaps the second greatest swordsman in the land, and fairly early on in the game, after defeating <laughs> Sekiro has his first encounter with Ishin, who is in disguise as the Tengu of Ashina, coming very close to striking Sekiro down until the sight of the shinobi prosthetic on his left arm reminds him of a certain someone, and from here, Ishin is our ally. While Ishin used to be the head of the Ashina clan back during that dramatic battle 20 years ago, the mantle of leader has since passed to Genichiro, Ishin's adopted grandson, and the one responsible for severing Wolf's arm from his body at the start of the game. See, Wolf's efforts to rescue and then save Kuro throughout the game all take place in a backdrop of war. Whilst Ashina won the last war with the interior Japanese ministry, they are almost doomed to fail the next. This sad reality is the reason why Genichiro is holding Kuro, it's because he needs the gift of Kuro's immortality for Ashina to stand a chance at winning the war, the same immortality which Kuro gifted the wolf. Genichiro is utterly driven by his ambition to save his beloved land of Ashina, and as we see, will do absolutely anything to win the next war. Next we have Emma, also known as the Gentle Blade. Emma is the woman at the start who drops the note into the well, endeavouring Wolf to get to Moonview Tower to see Kuro. She is a medical genius, having been the apprentice of a now deceased surgeon by the name of Dogen, and is in fact the creator of the self-refilling healing gourd used by Wolf throughout the game. Furthermore, she is actually the personal doctor of Ishin, tending to him as his illness takes its course. Emma aids Wolf many times throughout his journey, but in fact, this is all done at the behest of Ishin, even the dropping of the note at the start of the game. 
Although Isshin and Genichiro are of the same clan, and although the country is facing a grim loss in the rapidly approaching conflict, Isshin knows that immortality is not the answer, and that as pure as Genichiro's ambition to save Ashina is, if indeed his ambitions even are pure, immortality corrupts the souls of men. Isshin knows this, and Kuro knows it too, hence why he never gives in to Genichiro's repeated attempts to have the power of Kuro's divine blood bestowed upon him. Once Ashina Castle is reached, Wolf is reunited with Kuro, but also Genichiro, except this time Wolf is far stronger, and after the most intense and challenging fight of the game thus far, Genichiro is bested. As we see, although Genichiro does not yet possess the divine immortality of Kuro's ancient blood, he has found a more unclean alternative, drinking from a source known as the Rejuvenating Waters, allowing him to survive blows that would be mortal to regular men. It's corruption like this which Ishin has no wish to see spread throughout Ashina or the world, hence why he has gone as far as to help Wolf put a stop to Genichiro, even if it means the death of Ashina. After Genichiro's defeat, Ishin will remain here to provide intel and history to Wolf for the missions to come, although we still see him out and about as the Tengu, eliminating rats sent by the Interior Ministry. Ishin is an incredibly strong character, because although he is a killing machine, particularly back in his prime, where he'd constantly put himself in mortal situations so as to hone his killing ability, he is also very wise never deigning to extend his power into the realm of corrupting immortality as his grandson has. By the way, one of the ways to learn more about the backstories of the key characters in this game is to ply them with wine, and the specific dialogue you get depends on what type of sake you give them. Even though I'd beaten this game many times before, I'd actually never heard this awesome dialogue from Ishin about the rebellion 20 years ago, and locked after giving him the Ashina sake in particular so there's a decent chance that some others also haven't heard it. <笑><笑> この<笑> そして<笑> ああ、日の元の乱れが<笑> Another very interesting tidbit about Ishin is that he is actually the one who cut off the left arm of the sculptor many years ago, not done out of casual brutality, but because the sculptor was on the brink of becoming Shura, a person who has become completely blood drunk, concerned only with killing, tantamount to a demon. Ishin saved the sculptor from this fate, and afterwards he became a great shinobi, being the first one to make use of the shinobi prosthetic developed by Emma's mentor, Dogen. Of course, Wolf would then go on to don the prosthetic in place of his left arm, and as well as his grappling hook, there are many other shinobi tools scattered throughout the land of Ashina which can be fitted onto his prosthetic by the sculptor. I'm not going to go into detail on all 10 of them, but the first one most players will come across is the shuriken wheel, which allows Wolf to send out damaging projectiles to enemies from afar. 
I imagine the shuriken wheel is also one of the tools most players will use from beginning to end, simply because of how universally applicable it is, although its effectiveness will certainly vary from situation to situation. You're not really going to be doing any significant damage to bosses with this tool, although it can certainly help inch up their posture bar somewhat. For regular enemies though, it can be massively effective, taking them out in just 2 or 3 hits in some cases, although enemies will quickly become wise and start blocking your projectiles after a few throws. The next tool discovered will likely be the flame barrel, found on the Herata estate, and a certain merchant found in the Ashina outskirts area will give Wolf some intel on where it can be found. Worth mentioning too that with the exception of the finger whistle, every other shinobi tool is completely optional to pick up and it's quite easy to miss them entirely, especially the mist raven, which happens to be one of my favourites to use. Anyway, the situation with the flame barrel is really cool because in the outskirts you can eavesdrop on some guards discussing a big scary ogre intended for use in an upcoming battle, saying that if it gets loose then to use fire as indicated by its glowing red eyes. Although there aren't actually that many of them throughout the game, any time you see an enemy with glowing red eyes, they'll be especially weak against fire, taking big damage and getting stunned. So from here, you go away to Herata, find the flame barrel, fit it to your prosthetic, come back to the ogre and stun the hell out of him with blazing bursts of fire from your arm. By the way, anyone else absolutely love fighting ogres in this game? I know this big fella was a major issue for a lot of new players due to his pretty large health pool, high damage and lightning fast grabs, but once you learn his moves he's really satisfying to fight and is one of the few enemies in the game where I think it's better to dodge rather than deflect, with another example being Juzo the drunkard, another sick enemy. The game's actually quite fond of doing that thing of presenting some challenging foe and giving you a hint as to how it might be beaten and then you go off and find a new shinobi tool for Wolf's prosthetic, come back and then conquer the enemy. Very satisfying game design. Sometimes an enemy might even have a significant weakness which isn't even hinted at at all, like how you can use the loaded spear to yank out the one from the guardian ape's bloody neck in the second phase of that boss. Although most of the game's shinobi tools are offensive in nature, there are defensive ones too, like the loaded umbrella and the mist raven. And the Mist Raven is so ridiculously fun to pull off, allowing you to phase through nearly any enemy attack, following up with a deadly slice to the vitals. Of course, every tool can also be upgraded, requiring various upgrade materials as well as some Sen. These upgrades are almost never just flat damage increases either, but rather they tend to add functionality, additional attacks or other unique aspects to the tool. For example, the shuriken can be upgraded to the spinning shuriken, allowing the player to hold the button down so that it will attack enemies multiple times instead of just the once, or you can later upgrade it to the phantom kunai, materialising damaging phantom butterflies which will home in on the enemy. Or take loaded umbrella, at first it simply acts as an excellent shield, allowing the player to block whilst moving, but then later it can be upgraded to defend against specific types of damage. The phoenix's lilac umbrella upgrade in particular is just about essential for taking on several specific mini bosses, namely the Headless and the... Uh, uh, those other guys too. By the way, quick side note about the Headless enemies in this game. I hate them. Look, this game is awesome, but I really don't like these guys. You pretty much need a special item called Divine Confetti to deal real damage to them. There's fog in the area which prevents you from dodging. They do high damage attacks with great range. They have a grab attack where they stick their hand into Wolf's arse and pull out god knows what organ. And worst of all, for every hit you take, your terror meter builds up, and when this fills up, you die. People thought Frenzy was rough back in Bloodborne, but terror is way rougher. Obviously the intention here was to make these fights as tense as terrifying as possible, and FromSoft definitely achieved that, but jeez, they're so stressful, to the point where I don't really enjoy them. But anyway, back to Shinobi tools, again. As fun and useful as they certainly are, at the end of the day, tools are all they really are, not main damage dealers. This is partly due to the fact that it costs a resource called Spirit Emblems each time they're used, and it doesn't take too long before they run out due to Wolf only being able to carry a max of between 15 to 19 at a time. Also, you really can finish the entire game and never even touch Shinobi tools and still perform just fine due to the strength of the core combat mechanics, but then that would make for a relatively dull playthrough, 
when you consider the satisfaction and impact of tools like the Loaded Axe or the Mist Raven. I will say though that for the game's harder bosses, a lot of the times when I'd use a shinobi tool, it wasn't necessarily because I needed to use it, but rather because they're really fun to use. Then again, tools like the Firecrackers and Loaded Spear help massively for bosses like the Guardian Ape. And I know there's a way to significantly reduce the difficulty of the Demon of Hatred boss by using the Mark Intent Finger Whistle, although I've never tried that myself. I've spoken a bunch about the game's bosses and mini bosses, but goddamn, Sekiro has some outstanding boss battles, not to mention some really, really hard ones that you will die on again and again until you finally get to grips with their moveset and deliver that final shinobi execution. One of the things which separate regular bosses from mini bosses is that after being a regular boss, you will receive an item called a memory, which can be activated at a sculptor's idol to increase Wolf's attack power for the remainder of the game, and indeed this is the only way to permanently increase your damage output. One of the coolest, sickest and most horrific moments in my last 20 some years of gaming is after I beat the Guardian Ape, after many, many attempts. I leaned back in my chair and exhaled in pure relief. What a nightmare of a boss that was. And then the boss gets back up, and it's not moving like an ape anymore. Whereas before the Guardian Ape leapt about and lashed out in pure primal primate fury, now it undulated and slanked back and forth around the arena in bizarre grotesque contortions, followed by terrorising shrieks, wielding an enormous katana with uncanny style and dexterity. Honestly one of the best boss fights of any game, I just can't express enough how much I love this. Unfortunately they did spoil it a wee bit, because later on in the game, you actually fight the Headless Ape again, but this time with its partner, and to be honest, I hate this fight. It's not simply that they reused an incredible fight that I dislike, but rather the whole two on one thing. The small ape which appears in the second phase does have quite low health and posture, and is vulnerable to the firecrackers tool, but even so I don't feel that it's reasonable to throw both these enemies at the player at one time. I always die a bunch of times whenever I fight these two due to how chaotic it can get. Though you actually can skip this fight entirely if you happen to come through this area before fighting the Guardian Ape in the Sunken Valley. In addition to the Double Ape fight, there's just one more main boss I am not a fan of, and that's the Folding Screen Monkeys. The idea for it is actually pretty great, there being four monkeys in this large arena who need to be taken out, each having different qualities, making them difficult to catch and kill. The problem is that I don't want to do this. You can actually kind of brute force this fight if you get a bit lucky, but there are various interactions in the buildings to the corners of the arena which can aid in trapping the monkeys, but I always just find all this quite frustrating and tedious, rather than thrilling and challenging. That said, I do still appreciate that FromSoft were trying to do something a bit different here, but I personally just don't really enjoy this. There are a bunch of other really incredible bosses though, with another highlight being the Corrupted Monk, who also goes all wormy in its final phase, hitting you with foul, terror-inducing vomit and pirouetting around one of this game's many strikingly stunning boss arenas. An optional boss fought towards the end of the game that I know a lot of folk really don't like too much is the Demon of Hatred, with the main criticism being that it plays more like a Bloodborne boss and requires the player to throw out a lot of the game had been teaching them up until that point. For example, deflections aren't too useful in this fight, with dodges being of far greater utility. Furthermore, this guy is pretty damn big and has a crap load of health. Personally, I think Demon of Hatred is an awesome boss, but yes, very challenging. It's one of those bosses that took me about 50 damn attempts back when I first played the game, but as now I can nail it after just 2 or 3, much like some of the tougher bosses from the Souls games like Fume Knight or Slave Knight Gale. Also, although the boss kinda comes out of nowhere, there's actually real significance to it, because this raging flaming demon is in fact the very sculptor who saved us back at the start of the game. Earlier on, the sculptor makes several references to the flames of hatred that he sees, and that all his sculptures come out looking wrathful and demonic, despite his efforts to the contrary, and despite the efforts of Ishin to prevent the sculptor's transformation into Shura by cutting off his arm, this wasn't enough to later stop him becoming a demonic incarnation of hatred. When I first fought this boss, 
It wasn't even initially aware that it was the sculptor, but when you notice its missing left arm, replaced with ethereal fire, and the comments of the nearby old woman afterwards, and the words of the demon itself during its demise, then it all comes together. And so I think that's a good time to get back to the story. After Wolf defeats Genichiro and is reunited with Kuro as well as Emma and Ishin, Kuro reveals that due to the inevitable corruption of men's souls associated with the immortality of his divine blood, he wishes to sever his immortality altogether so as to keep it forever out of the reach of those who would use it to further in their own ambitions. Furthermore, Kuro references Wolf's own condition, himself being immortal, having been made so by Kuro's own hand. Thus, the new goal is to help Kuro achieve what he calls immortal severance, although it's not entirely clear yet what that might entail. After some information and guidance from Ishin, isolated in his nearby tower, we learn of a forbidden weapon called the Mortal Blade, said to be the only armament capable of shedding the Diviner's ancient blood. Thus, from here on, the destination is Senpu Temple on Mount Kongo where the Mortal Blade is sequestered. Although Mount Kongo is a beautiful environment, far more bright and colourful compared to the snow and stone of central Ashina, there are great horrors to be found here. This is because the monks here have turned away from the ways of Buddha and their perverse obsession with immortality. Whereas the immortality of Kuro is considered divine though, the immortality found at Senpu Temple is associated with a foul infestation of enormous centipedes, and those infested with this monstrous insect cannot die, or at least not unless the centipede has been struck with the crimson steel of the mortal blade. In the heart of Senpu Temple, there are several vile infested immortal monks shift around in uncanny morbid motion lies the inner sanctum of the Divine Child. A catch with the mortal blade is that anyone who touches it will instantly perish, thus sealing off its crimson power. However, Wolf, with his ability to rise back up from death, can overcome this barrier, claiming the mortal blade and gaining the power to sever the immortality of those afflicted with the centipede, as well as getting one step closer to nullifying the immortality associated with Kuro's divine blood. From this point on in the game, there are several other ingredients which Kuro tasks Wolf with gathering, all towards the purpose of creating a mystical aroma needed to allow access to the Divine Realm, but the tears of a being known as the Divine Dragon must be collected, these being necessary for the ritual of immortal severance. One of these items, the Lotus of the Palace, is located where the Guardian Ape was defeated. The Shelter Stone is located in the Wedding Cave after defeating the laughing apparition of the corrupted monk in Mibu Village, and the last ingredient, the Aromatic Branch, is located on the person of none other than Wolf's own foster father, Owl. See, it turns out that Owl did not die back in that bandit attack on Harata. Rather, he faked his own death, and the very person who stabbed Wolf in the back prior to his rescue by Kuro was Owl. It turns out that Owl had always been after immortality for himself, another one seduced by its power, though of course, Kuro rejects his advances just as he had with Genichiro. At this point, Wolf confronts Owl who instructs his foster son to follow the first rule of the Iron Code and betray Kuro. Very interestingly, you can actually end the game very early on here if you really want, and choosing to betray Kuro will lead to a really excellent boss with Emma and Ishin, followed by Wolf stabbing Owl in the back and then becoming Shura. However, I wouldn't recommend anyone choosing this option for a first playthrough because you're missing out on a ton of the game if you do, although the boss against Emma and Ishin here is fantastic. Rather, if you choose to stay loyal to Kuro, then the one who Wolf must fight is Owl. He's a trickster, fights dirty, uses some of the same tools that Wolf does, and makes for a fantastic encounter. 
I love the way they make Wolf so much smaller than everyone in this game, and it really makes figures like Owl look all the more imposing and unbreakable. But now that all the ingredients have been gathered to produce the sacred aroma, Wolf is about ready to begin his ascension to the Divine Realm. However, before that, there's the question of which ending to go for. So, for this playthrough I opted for the Purification ending, because the path towards it unlocks some extra content, including one of the hardest fights in the game. See, it turns out that one aspect of the Immortal Severance ritual involves Kuro himself being beheaded by the Mortal Blade. And although Kuru himself is aware of this sacrifice that he'll have to take, he's keeping it quiet so as not to cause extra hardship on Wolf. However, through various dialogue with Emma, an alternative method of immortal severance is discovered, still involving the tears of the Divine Dragon, but also requiring a lost item called an aromatic flower. Unfortunately, it is deduced that an aromatic flower from the branch of the Sakura tree no longer exists in Ashina. However, through the use of a bell charm which Emma found on the body of Owl, Wolf can again relive through an alternative version of a memory by visiting Harata and facing the true Owl, only much harder. Owl Father is a far more technical fight than the one we previously fought, with even more tricks and switch-ups. Defeating Owl here yields the aromatic flower, and thus only one more ingredient is necessary for the purification ritual, which will spare Kuro, who is still only a child, from finality. Tears of the Divine Dragon Fountainhead Palace is the most unique level compared to anywhere else in the game, and also the most beautiful. Graceful feminine beings known as the Okami guard and patrol the various temples and structures, whilst a gargantuan carp prowls the deep body of water connecting it all. Glowing roped figures stroll the halls, playing haunting melodies on their flutes, their docility betraying a depraved lust for youth. And indeed, if the player lingers for too long within eyesight of one of these palace nobles, then they will be afflicted with a unique status ailment called enfeeblement, spelling almost certain death. Thus, despite the cherry blossoms and the endearing playfulness of the Akame warriors in this seemingly tranquil realm, there are certainly disturbing elements at play. Traversing through the palace and ascending higher through the fountainhead, dodging lightning bolts and ascending through the Tori gates, Wolf comes across the still figure of Tomoe, Genichiro's mentor, and from here we enter the realm of the Divine Dragon.
This is one of those sections of the game where I'm partly loath to even attempt to describe it and praise it with my usual flowery language, but I will say this. I love this fight, and the emotional intensity of the soundtrack is nearly enough to make me shed a tear. Now that all the ingredients for the ritual are collected, all that's left is to return to Kuro and get on with it. However, Ashina is in flames. The Interior Ministry have attacked, and elite shinobi are wreaking havoc within the outskirts and castle, slaughtering and burning all in their path. What's more is that the great Lord Ishin has succumbed to his illness and passed away, with this event possibly being the catalyst for the Ministry's full-scale invasion. Furthermore, Genichiro has once again stolen away Kuro and is to be found through that same secret passage by the reservoir, in that moonlit field of silver grass where everything once changed. ケイチロ殿。その From here, battle with Genichiro once again commences, except now Genichiro has his own legendary blade, and with it some deadly new moves, although his core moveset is much the same as before. This is not a difficult fight however, and after a bit of practice, Genichiro can be taken down very quickly. However, Genichiro Ashina is not the true final encounter of Sekiro, because in his last desperate attempt at victory, Genichiro opens the very gates of the underworld with a ghastly slice from his black mortal blade. <laughs> Ishin, the Sword Saint, is Ishin as he was in his absolute prime. He has the most complex move set in the whole game the most varied selection of perilous attacks and will only go down after a gruelling three death blows and that's not even counting the mandatory fight with Genichiro before every attempt. Furthermore, all three of Ishin's phases are different. Although the first phase seems brutal and impenetrable at first, not least of all due to the intimidation factor, it's not actually as hard as it first seems and you can get really consistent with it. Thankfully, Ishin isn't at all shy about using thrust attacks in this phase, and I pretty much saw these as a gift for building up his posture. It's his second phase where the difficulty and intensity really ramps up to obscene levels as Ishin pulls out his spear and pistol, dominating the field with wide, wild slices, thrusts, and gunshots. I've always found this particular phase of the boss to be the single most difficult challenge out of the whole game, 
and although I'm certainly better at it now than I once was, I don't think I'll ever get good at this. Its combos are just too much to handle. Thankfully, its third phase, although still very difficult, also comes with a gift, and that gift is lightning attacks. In Sekiro, lightning attacks can be fairly easily countered, dealing massive damage to the opponent, and Ishin isn't at all shy about using the attacks in phase 3, although his other combos only increase in ferocity, and coupled with the sheer tension of having made it to phase 3, the intensity of Ishin, the Sword Saint, is insane. But then you get him. At this point, all that's left is to perform the purification ritual. While this ritual will spare the life of Kuro, another life must be offered in his place. Sekiro is an incredible game. It delivers a tight, refined combat system more brutally punishing than any other modern FromSoft game, but because of how deliberate and satisfying it all feels, even when I, as a player, found myself on the precipice of frustration, I simply could not deny its brilliance. Throughout my many playthroughs of Sekiro since its release, I've always considered it to be a superb game but just couldn't quite get to the place of love I had for titles like Dark Souls 3 and Bloodborne. However, after this most recent playthrough, yeah, I love Sekiro. Jesus Christ, what a beautiful game. It simply has too many moments of brilliance, both from gameplay and narrative standpoints, and though disturbing and disgusting in some areas, it manages to achieve outstanding levels of beauty and emotional weight in others. The story certainly takes some work to follow along with, but it's well worth it, especially with such complex and morally grey characters. Our protagonist Wolf is a brutal killer, and Lord Ishin is famed for being a single-minded killing machine in his prime, and yet the morality of their actions is almost on a higher, nobler level, making them all the more compelling. Also, the purification ending that I opted for in this playthrough 
isn't even the definitive ending, because in the homecoming ending, things turn out far less tragic, even ending on an optimistic note. And folks, on that optimistic note, I shall end the video. And so, as always, cheers for watching, and cheerio.